yeah, and starting. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you ever so much for joining another online uh, parents event. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to join us and be with us. We've done a couple of these events now and the feedback we've had from them is really positive. So we, we thought we'd do them um, every so often just to keep you informed, give you a chance to ask any questions you like. Hope you're all well. I hope you're all uh, looking forward to a well-deserved break over half term and the Jubilee uh, celebrations. Um, just generally things are going very well in school at the moment. We've, we're in the middle of the exam season uh, for year 11 and 13. And you'd never really know that we haven't done exams in school for, for three years uh, because they were obviously cancelled in 2020 and 2021. And it's been a long time since we've done them, but uh, everything's gone remarkably well and all the students have really engaged well with them. And it really does feel like we are uh, back to normality uh, and, and those years that we had uh, are becoming a distant memory. Not, not quick enough, mind you, but they are nevertheless becoming a distant memory. Um, the purpose of tonight is to um, talk to you about uh, teaching and learning in the school. So how we uh, teach students in school, uh, what, what, what the, the science behind how students learn is, and a bit about homework and the importance of homework. Uh, and Mr Mabry is going to come and join my seat in a minute uh, to talk you through that in detail. Uh, before we do that, I'm just going to pull up um, a, a PowerPoint slide uh, with the school's mission statement. If you could do it for me, Jane. Yeah. Absolutely. And as we go through the presentation, feel free to add any questions you've got in the chat and then myself or Mr Mabry will pick them up uh, with you at the end. Uh, and if there's lots of them, we'll, we'll, we'll lump them together as broad themes. OK, that is live now should be on the screen. There's a red box around me, so I don't know if that means I'm live or if, if parents can see. There we the go. That's fine. If you turn it into a slide, so then please, Jane, so they don't see all the stuff on the outside. There we go. Perfect. So this is the mission statement of Bacon's College. Uh, we want to ensure that every student is well educated, cared for, uh, and exhorted to achieve the academic and personal excellence that would lead to university or skilled work and or to a fulfilled and to a fulfilled life. So we reiterate, reiterate this to the students uh, many, many times. Um, I present this to all parents when they're looking at Bakers College for their children when they're, they're in year six. And this, this summarises what we try to do as a school. So obviously being well educated, being cared for is really important and we spend a lot of time um, um, making sure students do feel safe and secure in school. And that word there, exhorted uh, to achieve academic stand and personal excellence, that means far more than just encouraging. Uh, we do believe that just encouraging pupils to achieve well or um, having the aspiration that they achieve well is not enough. You know, we really need to be active both as a school uh, and at home to really push, in other words, students to achieve uh, that level of academic and personal excellence because we want students to make progress in school. I fundamentally believe that the biggest difference that we can make to every young person's life chances is that they leave us with the best possible grades. You know, that may sound really basic, but it is also really, really important. The best grades they get from us means they get to the best six forms. Hopefully that's ours, but there's other choices as well. And then on to the best universities. And once they get to those places, uh, their life chances are improved. So that's what we want to do. Um, Bacon's really does care for students very well and it has done for, for many, many years. Um, and what we've done in the last more recent years is to really drive up those academic standards and that personal rigour to help students get to university or if they want to go straight into work, it's a skilled uh, profession and then on to a fulfilled life. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. And like I say, as a college, we spend the vast majority of our time working and thinking about how students learn, how can we teach them better? How can they learn more? How can they know more? How can they remember more? And ultimately, how can they go on to get the best possible outcomes? So that's a very, very broad summary of what we do as a school. And to give you the far more comprehensive update on, on what we do in terms of teaching and learning in the school, I'm going to invite uh, Mr Mabry, John Mabry, to take my seat because um, we had a few technical hitches. So over to him now. OK, good evening, everyone. Um, James, do you mind just uh, changing the slide, please? 
All right, so my name is Mr Mabry. Um, I'm Assistant Principal for Teaching and Learning at, at Bacon's College here. Um, and, and the title for this 10 minute presentation for you tonight is the science of, of learning and, and the craft of teaching. And I'm, I'm going to start with a little bit uh, about how the brain learns in, in terms of uh, current scientific thinking, linking that then to what we do in our in, in our classrooms around the school and then and then linking that to the, the kind of our policy with homework and, and, and how it all kind of fits together. So I'm just going to begin just by looking at the next slide, please, Jane. Just very, very quickly, some basic, uh, some basic learning psychology for you here. Obviously, the brain does lots of different things. Uh, obviously, though, the brain is involved uh, in, in learning and, and learning new knowledge. Now, there's two parts of the brain that are involved in actually learning new knowledge. And every piece of information we learn, every piece of new information that's around us passes through the part of our brain, which is called the working memory. Um, and it then has to go from the working memory into the long term memory. And Jane, if you just click through a few more bits, please. OK, so yeah, keep going. Now, the interesting thing is that your long term memory, all the facts that you can keep in your brain once they're in there is potentially unlimited. There's no limit to the number of facts and pieces of information that you can keep. But the issue is that to get there in the first place, it's got to pass through your working memory. And your working memory, interestingly, on average, can only hold around about five pieces of new information at one time. And if we just look at some of the things that I'm talking about by clicking through the slides a bit more. And keep going, please. What that means for a student is it could mean any noise around the room. It could mean what's going on on, on, the, on the teacher screen. If there's any um, if, if, if there's any distractions at all, even the task itself, just having a blank piece of paper in front of you and having to complete a task can actually be quite overloading for your working memory, which, as I've just said, can only hold about five pieces of information at once. So a lot of our kind of approach to teaching and learning in the classroom is, is based upon this science, the, the, the science of how the brain learns. We want this, we want this knowledge to go into our, the students' long term memory, but we've got to be aware that to get there in the first place, it's got to, it's got to be passed through um, the, the working memory, which can quite easily get overloaded. So if we now look at what that might have looked like a few years ago by just going to the next slide. What would have happened traditionally in classrooms, and this is definitely what would have happened when I was at school, is you would have been taught some some information. So, in an example on the screen on the screen there, you've 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 been given an example of looking at animal and plant cells in, in a science lesson, and the teacher would have gone through it, would have taught it, and then straight away got you into a kind of task for you to complete, um, which is the independent task. So, if we just click forward again, um, and it, you it could be something like, right, I've, I've taught you this now. I want you now to write a paragraph in silence on the similarities and differences between these types of cell. Um, and we and I think a lot of students would kind of struggle with that. So if you look at another example, just to kind of make my point on the next slide, um, it could be an English lesson, which would have in the past been about reading a, a section of a book or a play like an in, in Inspector Calls, and then straight away gone into um, actually then independently writing a paragraph, in this case on how Priestley presents Mr. Burning in Inspector Calls. And, and, and that kind of big jump from just putting knowledge into a, a student's brain and then straight away um, actually then just getting them to do something with it. A lot of students kind of struggle with that as, as we found out over the years. So what we do a lot of now at the school is if, if we just click forward the slide, is something called guided practice. It's the kind of link between all the knowledge that the student learns and then setting them up to actually um, to actually do an independent piece of work. So if we go back to the English example just now, what does this guided practice look like? Um, and I'll show you on the next slide. And a lot of what we do at this school is is a lot of work under something called a visualizer, which is which is basically like, like a web, webcam. Actually, we've got some examples of them being used around the school here. And once we've taught the knowledge to the students, we show them then how to apply it. And that's that's what guided practice is. So you, you've got some great examples here of, of, of teachers showing or modeling how to draw a graph. Uh, in the math lesson there on the bottom right, you've got Mr Mills showing them what they need to type into the calculator to actually then apply that learning. Uh, Mr Chrome on the bottom there showing how to use a protractor to look at ray diagrams in science and, and, and so on and so on. So if, if you ever come and see uh, the teaching within our school, you'll see a lot of this thing, um, a lot of these visualizers being used to actually bridge that gap between new new information being learned and then students being known, being shown how to apply it. So if we just uh, then go to the next slide. What that would look like then in, in that in that English example just now is the Inspector Calls example would be that uh, they would do the text as before, that, that they would read a section of the book before, but then under the visualizer, 
they would look at that text and annotate it as a class together. So the, so the teacher would have the same worksheet as the students and they would annotate all the key, pop, key parts of that text that they then need to construct the essay. And then going on from that on the bottom right there, you can see what would then happen is the teacher would start to begin to model how to actually start to, to form a paragraph in that essay. And gradually over, over the next kind of part of the lesson, the teacher would re gradually remove that support to give the students much more confidence in actually then completing that independently. Uh, if we could just go to the next slide, please. So what you've kind of got there are those four steps. Um, and I'm showing you this now because this is this is the poster that we have in all of the classrooms around the school. Um, and it's something that we've done a lot of work on. As, as simple as those four steps look, all the teachers are aware that when they're preparing their lessons for, 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 for our students, we need to always think about those four steps. It's about teaching the students the new knowledge and checking they've learnt it. It's then about guiding them through that practice and how to apply that knowledge to set them up perfectly for this kind of mastery phase, this phase where students can, can work independently in silence and, and, and show a really high success rate in what they're trying to achieve. But the bottom one there is, is something I've not quite shown you yet, and it's, it's called the retrieval of knowledge. And that's all about the fact that we know that if, if, if we don't keep revisiting what, what students have learned, they're going to start forgetting it. It's inevitable. So we need to revisit that. And on the next slide is something that looks quite technical, um, but it's called the forgetting curve. And the green line that you can see that starts at 100 percent and quite quickly goes down shows how quickly your brain, your long term memory loses knowledge that, that, that you've recently acquired. So after about three days, you, you've lost something. You, you're down to about 60 percent of, of what you first learned. Um, and what you what you see in the kind of dotted and pink lines is that the more times that you revisit stuff you've learned before, um, the more the, the longer it gradually stays in the brain. So we, we do a lot of um, retrieval practice as well. We, we obviously teach the students new knowledge and we set them up to be able to apply that knowledge. But importantly and essentially, actually, we still then also revisit that knowledge frequently to make sure that it stays in, in, in their long term memory. And if we just go to the next slide, please. So every lesson in, in at Bacon's starts with a with a with a very quick five to seven minutes do now and these these have been a really important part of our teaching and learning because they're ready for the students to start as soon as the students arrive at every single lesson they're just a very simple five to six question, questions based on stuff they've learned before um, and it's something that that the students know that they complete in silence so every every student every, every lesson starts with in complete silence for the first five minutes it helps settle the class it allows the teacher to do the register but importantly, also revisits the, the stuff that students have learned before to, 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 to retrieve that knowledge that they've learned before. Um, and just to sum that up, you you'll be aware, I'm sure, that all of our students at Kinsey Stream Key Stage 4 were given Chromebooks um, at the start of the academic year. And homework really does form a big part of retrieval practice. Pretty much all our homework now is online. And on, on the screen now, you can see some of the platforms that, that, that we use for the various subjects around Bacon's. Um, and we've actually found that this has been a, a, a big success and, and a lot of the homework is, is based on what students have, have been learning in the previous uh, two to three weeks. So it actually helps another form of retrieval practice to get them to, to revisit that knowledge and actually practice applying it. Um, and I will, you've put in this final slide before, but it just shows you that we, we have this, this homework policy where we, we don't tell students what to complete on what day, but what we do expect is that um, every subject sets uh, and, and requires the homework to be submitted on the same day of each week. So Mondays is always English, for example, and Tuesdays is always maths. And we find that this structure has actually been has actually been really successful. Um, you'll be aware that we extended the school day slightly on, on two days a week early at the start of this year. So we have um, IST, which stands for Independent Study Day, between three and three, sorry, independent study time uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And that's all the students working on their Chromebooks, completing their homework in silence. And that, again, I think has really risen the academic ethos of the school and actually helped with the academic attainment of, of, of our students. So that I've, I've kind of tried to summarise in, in about 10, 15 minutes um, our approach to teaching and learning. Um, but that's, that's it, really. I'm happy to take any, any questions or queries any of you may have. Just yes. having had a look in the uh, John. Yep. Um, just looking, looking at, at 
I'm just, see, just scanning to see what which ones are about teaching and learning or whether they're more general okay. um, before we carry on, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a question about exams. We've got a question about logins. We've got a question about school trips. We've got a question about uniform. Um, and okay. I mean, Mr Wilson's back, so I'm happy to hand over to him if there's nothing to teach and learning specific. Not that I can see, no. Um, I'm sorry, there's a very long one here. I'm just reading through. Now, as you could, can you see them? Can you read the text? Uh, I'm just trying now. Uh, it's about uh, revision, about the chances of getting higher scores when they get examined. Given teachers would also know the topic. Sorry, it's, it's a very long question. Typical sample questions. I've, European, I've, sorry, go on. I've got, um, I've did, there's a couple that um, actually, I'm, I'm going to address a couple if that's okay. okay. So someone, someone's very appropriately risen about guided practice at school, also include guiding students how to organise themselves um, to facilitate their learning at home. Yes, I feel really strongly about that. I feel really strongly about that. Um, we've tried it before in IST. It, it, it wasn't the right forum for that. But what we're looking at doing for the next academic year is is a, is a really kind of comprehensive PSHE programme, which is personal um, social and health education, but expanding that to incorporate those kind of uh, skills that we want our students to learn, because I, I, I think we all feel really strongly that, yes, obviously academic attainment is important, but a big part of that is students being able to be independent with their studies and organise themselves. So that is in the pipeline from September, but we are definitely going to focus on that as well. Um, I'm just looking what else is up there. Um, examinations, I've, um, I think Mr Wilson might be able to answer that. There's a very long one about European languages. Um, I'm not sure, oh, there's one about revision planning as well. I'm just reading that. There's one about behaviour of children outside of school. What's mm. what's our policy on that? Um, Is there a school uniform? Yeah, Mr Wilson will do that. Um, but I think if um, I'll let me just have a look at the, I'll, I'll process some of the questions and I'll come back to you in a second. But I'll, I'll hand over to Mr Wilson now um, to, to address most of the questions you, that you've raised. OK, all right. I won't, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, welcome back everyone. Um, where do you want to start, Jane? Well, there's a question about behaviour when our students are outside of school, uh, when they're in school uniform, but they're not actually on school site. What is our, what's our policy and how, how do we manage students when they leave the school? Um, OK, so um, our expectations are that students will behave to the same standards outside of school as they do inside. Uh, clearly, it's very different when students leave school because there'll be a thousand uh, young people leaving within the space of about half an hour. In school, there's very close supervision because they're in classrooms and there's teachers on corridors. Outside, we just can't do that. So we accept the fact that you know, students will talk when they go home. And sometimes if you've got a large group of students all going in the same direction, it can be noisy. And, and we do recognise that and we do apologise to local uh, residents if that's the case. Uh, but the vast majority of times the, the students aren't doing anything bad. There's just a large group of people all in one place and that creates noise. So I go to Canada Water normally two or three times a week. Um, I'll stand at the bus stops. I'll wait there till the vast majority of students have gone home. Um, sometimes the station staff say the students are great and they just wait you know, and they get the bus. Sometimes the staff say the kids are really noisy and can we do anything about it? When they say the kids are really noisy, even when I'm there sometimes, they're not actually really noisy. There's just maybe 200 young people in a very small space all chatting and that creates a lot of noise. And if there is a couple of hundred adults um, all in the same place, all chatting, that's going to be noisy as well. So there's a difference between just being uh, young and leaving school and having a chat with your friend to behaviour that's completely unacceptable. So if we find any behaviour that's completely unacceptable, we will sanction students for that. So we don't tolerate any rudeness to members of the public, um, any kind of damage um, that goes on outside. We had a couple of students that threw things at local residents' doors a little while ago. We excluded those students. Um, if we get reports from Canada Water that individuals are uh, rude to the staff there or um, 
they're, they're, they're causing problems for the local businesses there. We'll investigate that and then we'll deal with those students. And we do do that quite a lot. It doesn't happen all the time, but when, when it does get reported to us, we do deal with it. Um, our policy is that um, students, if they're identifiable as a Bacon student outside of school, that we can act. So that doesn't always mean if they're in uniform either. So if a student takes their blazer off and takes their tie off, if the local people know that they're a Bacon student, as far as we're concerned, we can act in the same way as we would have done in school. And that's what I tell parents and that's what I do. So we're very sorry to anyone if there are any problems outside of school, do tell us if it happens. But if possible, do try and filter out what's just young people being young and chatting to their friends and watch young people doing things that are completely out of order because uh, there is a difference and the out of order stuff we, we will deal with certainly. Thank you for that. OK, we've got a question next about trips. Um, obviously, unfortunately, due to uh, COVID, there have been very few trips over the last two years. Um, question about um, are we doing trips now and uh, and what, what sort of things are they going to be? Well, well there have been trips actually. It may, maybe um, the, that, that parent's child hasn't been on those for whatever reason, the subject they were studying or so on. But we were very keen, I was very keen, that as soon as any restrictions were lifted from COVID, we got straight on and did what we could. So even when there was still quite a lot of restrictions, we still had students going out on trips. So we have lots of theatre visits, um, we've had art gallery visits, um, lots of football uh, and other sporting fixtures. Um, we've got a battlefield trip going out uh, this year in history in the summer. Um, we've had university visits. Uh, we did a Duke of Edinburgh's award expedition last year. So there has been quite a lot of stuff going on and it doesn't mean everyone will go out at the same time because um, obviously we can't do that. There's too many students, but there are lots of activities going on in lots of different subjects. And at some point we expect all students to be going out on at least one trip. Um, we have re rewards trips every summer. So the top 70 uh, students in every year group, according to the positive points they get, they'll go on a rewards trip and they'll be happening uh, just after the half term. And right towards the end of this term, we'll, we'll be uh, suspending lessons or most lessons for, for four days. And that's where students will go out on the majority of trips. So lots of departments are already starting to organise those visits and, that, and they will take place. So in summary, yes, we are doing trips. Uh, if your child hasn't been on one of those yet, uh, that's just because of the combination of subjects they're studying. But I do expect everyone to be going out on trips at some point. Thank you very much. And the next question is about the timing of exams. Um, just a question as to why they are straight after, for example, half term or the Christmas or Easter breaks. Yep. Um, do you want to just explain yep, a little sure. bit about the timings? So the ones that are after half term are the public exams. We have no control over those whatsoever. They're national and every student in the country will do their English, maths, chemistry, whatever exams at exactly the same time. So we have no control over that whatsoever. That's nationally set by the exam boards. Um, our other exams that we do, like our, for example, year seven to ten exams or the mock exams in year 11, um, sometimes they come straight after a holiday. Um, and the reason for that is we work backwards from when we have to get the marks in, submitted, analysed so we can do something meaningful with them, allowing a week or two for them to be marked and then not taking out too much lesson time for the students to do them. To, it's a quite a long winded process. Um, I can reassure you that uh, Mrs Annam, who organises it, spends an awful lot of time planning the exam calendar and it is a real, real chore to get it to work. And we discuss it as an SLT very regularly and it's a real balancing act between students coming out of lessons to do exams, giving enough time for marking, getting the marks on the system and communicated to parents having a parents evening so we can talk about those marks. There's quite a lot of things that need to happen. It's far more than just doing the exam. And if we if we try to say, right, there's no exam straight after um, a holiday or no more than two weeks after a holiday, for example, um, it just simply wouldn't work. There's not enough weeks in the year to get it all to be fitted in. You also have to factor in things like the hall. We've only got one space where we can do all the exams. We've got um, seven year groups in the school, all doing different exams in all different subjects. So logistically, it's very, very difficult to do. Lovely, thank you. And the next question is about guided practice at school. I think, did John cover that? Just does it include guiding students how to organise themselves yep. to facilitate their learning at home? Yeah, we, we do that. We did have a, a, a sort of study programme we started in ISTE, but it, it just didn't 
it just didn't achieve what we wanted it to do. The students themselves wanted to use that time to actually do their homework and do their studying rather than have a programme about learning how to study. But we do, we will be doing more of that work next year through PSHE to help them set up um, revision timetables, help them organise themselves, um, help them um, take notes. We have like, you know, what's called Cornell notes and so on. So we do do that. And in year 11, when we have our um, uh, preparation for exam evenings in year 11, we will actually show parents how to organise, uh, how, how students can organise their, their workload, even to the extent that we'll show a sort of mock uh, bedroom, what that could look like set up as a, as a study space as well. OK, thank you. Um, this one's a little bit broad. Um, it's how do you help students who are struggling? And I suppose the question would be it would be, um, you know, depending on the type of, of how they're struggling, whether it's physically, emotionally or whatever. I don't know if you can just elaborate a little bit on how we support students. Sure. Yeah. Big question. <laughs> so yeah. it, could, it could encompass all of those things. So um, if students are struggling, uh, just generally, well, let's 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 break it down. And so if there's issues with behaviour, uh, we will look at that because we'll be picking up trends about isolation and exclusion, and then we'll put interventions into place to support students with their behaviour. They are some of the programmes we run, like Football Beyond Borders, uh, School of Hard Knocks, um, and we'll, we'll put those interventions in place, report to the heads of year, report to SLD uh, to try and improve um, behaviour. If it's students studying with emotional wellbeing, uh, there's all sorts of mechanisms that students can report that themselves uh, to us. Uh, and also teachers are very, very alert to that kind of thing and we'll be picking that up. Some of that can be addressed through form tutors in the heads of year, um, you know, just to discuss whatever issues there are. Um, some of those interventions I mentioned earlier would be appropriate in those situations as well. We also have our own in-house counsellor at school that we can um, assign students to um, and external agencies such as CAMS if there's um, more, more serious concerns around mental health, for example. So we have got lots of support mechanisms in place uh, for that and students are really um, free to bring those concerns to us. They, they can just talk to us or there's various online um, systems they can use like Toot Toot for example to raise any concerns and we pick these up all the time uh, and, and work our way through them and do what we can to support. If your student's falling behind in lessons, um, the, the most important thing is what we call quality first teaching. So the individual teacher will look at what students are falling behind, look at their assessment scores and address that in the classroom. What we don't do hardly at all um, is to remove students from the classroom. So removal from the classroom is, is something we really don't do unless it's a last resort because the best place for students to be learning is in the classroom and students will be supporting them in there. If students need additional support with literacy, for example, we have literacy intervention groups and that takes the place of some MFL lessons. Uh, where students get into key stage four, we have what's called core plus lessons. So if some students, it would benefit them not to study as many GCSEs as others, they can come out of a GCSE option, and they can get extra time uh, in English and maths as well. So a big question um, with, I could probably give a bigger answer than what I've just done, but there's lots of mechanisms we can do to support students with, with whatever they, they might need. Thank you. And it's probably just worth reiterating that obviously if you do have a specific concern, then obviously you need to get in touch with year lead or or, um, or academic tutor. Um, OK, next question about homework. What are the consequences if a student doesn't finish their homework? Well, I, I'm going to be a bit uh, provocative and say, do you, do you mean at home or at school? <laughs> um, so in school, um, if we, we changed the system where if they don't do a homework, they get an immediate detention. Uh, we, we, we've moved away from that. What we do now is if a student doesn't do three homeworks in half a term, uh, they will trigger a detention. We started off doing those on Saturday mornings, so the student would do a Saturday morning detention. Now we've moved them to Friday afternoon. So because we finished slightly early on a Friday afternoon, if there's been three missed homeworks in a half term period, they'll have a two hour detention on a Friday afternoon. And of course, in that detention, they will do homework. So we want students to appreciate the value of homework. Uh, there is a sanction in place to do the homework, but it's a sanction that actually encourages them to do the work uh, as well as being a, a, a punishment. And I've got to be honest, the vast, vast majority of students, you know, a real credit to you. They are they are doing all of their work and, you know, we, we don't give out many homework detentions at all. Um, and 90% of every year group are doing all the homework we set, which is 
a real achievement and a real credit to you. Lovely, thank you. And then um, I'm not sure uh, if this is possible, but um, there's a question about the fact that students can access YouTube on their Chromebooks um, because um, the parent is concerned that their son is distracted by the fact that they can get onto YouTube. But I'm guessing they may be using YouTube also for resources for learning. Yeah, um, they're, 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 yeah, we do use YouTube quite a lot and um... You know, I'm a science teacher and I will um, find clips of science experiments and demonstrations and whatever and I will you know send those to the students and they'll watch them on YouTube. Uh, quite a lot of external um, providers of things like revision resources, um, they will, we're talking about free resources here, their medium of communicating it to to everyone is through is through YouTube. So it does get used quite extensively for that. So um, I, we can't universally block it because that, that would that would be a, a backward step. I don't know if individual parents can block uh, access on the Chromebooks. I'll make I'll make a note of that and ask the IT team, but my instinct is that it wouldn't be because all of the controls are operated centrally. Uh, yeah, sorry, I haven't got an easy answer to that one because it's one of those ones where if YouTube is used well, it's a really good resource. Uh, but obviously we don't want students looking at, you know, totally unrelated nonsense on YouTube because uh, that wouldn't be good. Yeah, OK. Sorry. No, I think that, that that's that's very clear. And as you said, one that we can take back to the IT team. Um, one of the questions here is, can students be taught maybe through role play exercises how to recognise um, conflict and, and it, issues in transition? How can they how can students be met with? Unf sorry, I'm just reading it. I'll come back to that one. Um, subject specific revision classes to prepare for their end of year assessments. Do we have those? Yeah. Oh, and not not in not in year seven to ten, because while they're going on, we're just in the we, we, we're in the midst of the GCSE and the A level exams and, that, and that's where they're going on. So no, we don't routinely do them for year seven to, um, to ten. Um, some some individual teachers might do them. And I don't want to downplay the importance of those exams, but we really wouldn't want to put students, for example, in year seven under the pressure of having um, extra revision classes in order to prepare for an end of year seven exam. What they've done in lessons combined with their homework, combined with their own independent revision at home should be perfectly su sufficient. So I don't want to downplay the importance of them because clearly they're important. We want to do very well in them, but I don't want to to um, make them appear to be higher stakes uh, the, the, than they would be. Uh, that, that, I don't think that would be healthy uh, for, for students to be panicking that they need to go to a revision class to prepare for, for an assessment. OK, thank you for that. And then just going back to the last question, it was what it was about mediation. So can students be taught how to recognise uh, where there are uh, issues that, uh, the, the, where perhaps somebody has reacted badly because of underlying consequences? And I think this perhaps is something we can um, talk about our mediation, student mediation, how they help to resolve con conflict within the school. Yeah, so we do um, do that in a taught fashion through the PSHE uh, curriculum where we do teach about conflict and conflict re resolution um, and you know obviously we expect that to have an impact on how students interact with each other also you know we, we're a christian school and, and lots of what we do through our assemblies and the messaging that students get through that uh, is about uh, respect and, and loving uh, our neighbors and treating each other with respect and dignity so lots of that happens either through the talk curriculum or through the um, um, the assembly and the tutorial curriculum and if there, and as you said uh, quite rightly, Jane, if there are any uh, disputes that that do arise, uh, which you know it does happen, uh, then um, we have our own mediation team in school uh, who are peer mediators. They're students themselves. Uh, they're professionally trained uh, to be mediators, and and they will have a mediation session uh, with those students to resolve to resolve those conflicts. And that's been a a long-standing feature of Bacon's and works very well. Thank you. And the next question um, is uh, right up your street, James. When do students start studying a range of subjects, for example, physics? <laughs> Great question. Um, as soon as possible is the answer, because you can never start too early in physics. Um, the answer to that is um, our Key Stage 3 curriculum is divided into subjects. So students will study English, math, science, history, geography, a language, PE, music, uh, um, and so on. I could keep going. Um, 
so if, the, if the question is specifically related to science, um, science is taught as the broad heading of science all the way through key stage three, and it will be divided up into topics uh, which will be chemistry, physics and biology topics. When students get to um, the end of year nine, they do their options for GCSE. At that point, they can study what's called the separate sciences. So they'll do three GCSEs, one in biology, one in chemistry, one in physics. If they don't opt for that, everyone does what's called combined science, where they'll do two GCSEs, which is a combination of biology, chemistry and physics all wrapped up together. But when the students do the exams, the exam papers are a biology paper, a chemistry paper and a physics paper, but they all together combine to give a combined science GCSE. Sorry, two of them. Lovely, thank you. And the next question is just about our uh, toilet policy during lesson time. Just wonder if you could just reiterate what that is and why it is. Uh, yep, so students should not be using the toilet during lesson time. Um, unless they've got a toilet pass. I'm trying to think how to say this diplomatically. So our view is that students get opportunity to use the toilet before school, at break time and lunchtime. So students should not need to be going to the toilet um, in lesson time because they've, they've had opportunity to use the toilet before. If the student's got a medical um, reason, then we will issue a toilet pass and they can use the toilet without question. They just show the toilet pass to their teacher and they can go and they can come straight back. The only time it will be questioned if we, is if we think students are misusing that uh, toilet pass, which does uh, happen some, sometimes. Uh, if um, a student, and they, and they, all right, okay, this is an element of judgment. So some pet parents are probably listening to this thinking, that's really cruel. If a student wants to use the toilet, why are you stopping them? That is balanced up by students that will deliberately try to leave lessons to use the toilet. And you know you may not believe this, but it does happen. Some students are known to leave the lesson, even though they're in different lessons. So a student will leave a physics lesson on one side of the school, and another student will leave a history lesson on the other side of the school at exactly the same time, because they're good friends, and they'll meet in a toilet at exactly the same time, and they'll have a good old chin wag, and they'll probably check their phones because we can't see what they're doing in the toilet, and then they'll make their way back to lessons eventually. So we've been doing this for a while now, and we know that children will do that from time to time. So we don't want students missing lesson time. So we don't want students out of lesson for any more time than needed, so that if they ask to go to the toilet straight after lunch or break, we'll say no. If it's obvious a child is in distress, particularly younger students who are learning to regulate their toilet habits, if it's obvious they're in distress, we'll just let them go. OK, that's the way it is. But if a student is clearly trying to get out of the lesson a bit too much, we'll just say no. And so you've only got uh, 10 minutes to break time. You'll have to wait. And that's about it. OK, lovely. Thank you very much. Next one is how can we apply to become a school governor? I'm assuming this uh, is a parent governor. Yep. Yeah, so we recently did that. Uh, we sent out uh, a, a very detailed letter with, with a Microsoft form for, for parents to apply. We went for a round of interviews with uh, prospective parent governors and the successful candidates will be an, announced to the, uh, the parent body uh, soon. So that process has actually concluded um, and all of our parent vacancy, parent governor vacancies are filled. Uh, so the next time that we do that, we will once again send out a letter and a link and we invite parents to apply to be a parent governor. And we're really delighted. We had a really uh, good field of applicants, both in terms of number uh, and what they could bring to the governing body. So it, it does show that parents are really engaged here. So if you missed out on this occasion, um, sorry about that. Um, there will be another occasion coming up at some point in the future, uh, but we do have parent champions as well, uh, which Jane, you know all about. And, and Tom Sargent runs as well. So if people are interested in the, the Parent Champion programme, um, I'm sure we can send them details of that or it will be on the website. Yes, absolutely. Um, I can send that out with the with the recording from this. Um, OK, are there extra study groups that are student led which take place at college, for example, in the evenings or weekends? I'm not aware of any, are you? No. Not if they're student led. No. Um, and um, do, do, someone's do, do, asked, I can, I can see the questions, well, there, Jane. So someone's okay. asked about how to get a toilet pass. Uh, toilet pass, the, the toilet pass is coordinated by our SEND department. So that's that's Miss Mataria who coordinates that. But your best bet is to just drop a quick email uh, to your students, to, to your child's head of year, uh, and then she will, and, and then your head of year will put you in touch with Miss Mataria. So as long as it's backed up by a medical reason, uh, then, then we can give toilet passes, no problem. 
Excellent. OK, next question. Are all the teachers qualified teachers? Do they continue to engage in CPD and update their training? I think that's def definitely a yes, but maybe you could just elaborate on how um, teachers are trained, uh, uh, ongoing training. Uh, yes, now, you know, to be completely transparent, we do have some staff in school who are not uh, qualified teachers, a uh, very, very small number. That's either because they have qualified overseas um, and they don't have UK, uh, what's called QTS. Uh, we're talking about a really small number here. And I can't I can't give you any more details. It could be obvious who they are, uh, but it is literally a couple um, and um, or because they're doing very, very small group uh, intervention work uh, and, and they, they haven't got uh, qualified teacher status to do that. But apart from literally a tiny, tiny number, yes, everyone's a qualified teacher. And yes, we spend the vast majority of time with staff focused on CPD. So Monday meetings after school are all about professional development. We have uh, CPD days. We have more than most schools because we're in United Learning. So we usually use about eight CPD days a year and they're all about teaching learning. So all the stuff you saw from Mr Maybury about getting students to uh, to know more, to remember more, to be able to do more. Uh, that's what we do uh, in, in the school and all the things you've seen about do nows, about the forgetting curve, about retrieval practice that all came around through through staff training. OK, lovely, thank you. The next question is about sports day. Um, will parents be able to attend the end of term sports day and what date is it? Oh, do you know calendar. what? I, I can't remember what we've done in the past. Is that one fact? Perhaps we can come back to you. Sorry, we well, mine's, gone, parents... mine's gone blank. I'm pretty sure we didn't invite parents last year. One, because there were still COVID restrictions and we had to keep um, separation. And what we did, it would have been three years before that. Sorry, I actually I actually can't remember what we've done, whether we've invited parents or not. Can I come back to you on that? Absolutely, I'll make a note of it. Sorry, I just okay. I've, I've kind of blurred between COVID and then we had we had two years where we couldn't do anything. Um, and then I don't know what we did before that. I mean, I, I, instead of me making it up on the spot, I'll come back to you. OK, one about um, a librarian. Um, are we planning to hire a librarian soon? That's actually advertised on the website now. That yep. post. We've advertised twice. Uh, we've we had some uh, potential applicants, but no one was suitable. Uh, we've gone out to various agencies to try and recruit someone. We're trying to open the library at break and lunchtime as much as we can with our existing staff. Obviously, it's not uh, it's not a great situation. If anyone does know anyone who wants to uh, work in school as a librarian, uh, please let me know. Please pass on that link. Um, feel free to give them my contact details directly so we can have a chat because yeah, we do want to get that vacancy filled uh, as soon as possible. OK, thank you. And um, question here about uh, school food and a concern about something that was bought in the canteen. But I think um, we'd need to know specific examples of that. Um, if, if somebody was concerned that they would bought something that was um, out of date, then obviously we would need to address that specific that specific incidents. But yeah, everything's made yeah. freshly on the day. So specific incidents, email, email to school office is something like that has happened um, and, and we'll look into it. If it has done, uh, we apologise and the, the, the caterers here work to a really high uh, standard um, and yeah, the, the, the food is good, is good quality food. Um, I, I do encourage all parents to, to, you know, to make sure their students are having a good, a good meal during the day, uh, particularly the, the hot plated food. We do do grab and go food as well, but the hot plated food um, is, is preferable. Um, and in the, I will say something actually while it's on topic, uh, in these challenging times with um, high inflation and we've seen the price of everything going up uh, in the shops you know it is really challenging for our um, catering team to actually m to, to break even because all of their costs are flying up you know they're cooking meals for uh, for two pounds thirty uh, sorry one, one pound eighty actually uh, for the meal plus the dessert two pound thirty so it's not it's not an easy job to do to try and create a healthy nutritious meal for that amount of money so the more people that are buying um, the, the meals in school, uh, the more economies of scale they got uh, and, the, and, the, and the better the offer we, we, we can make. But it is it is a real challenge. You know, some, some of their food costs, like the, the frying oil, for example, has literally doubled in value and, the, and they, they make, you know, they, they, they've really struggled to break even uh, on a Friday because uh, we have fish and chips just purely because of the cost uh, of all of the materials and the oil going up. It's a it's a massive headache. Sorry, that's me just talking a bit randomly, but summary. Please encourage your child to have a good, healthy meal in school. 
Absolutely, understood. Um, one question um, I'm going to read out um, and then after that I'm going to close the chat. So if you have any more questions, just because I'm conscious of time. So if you've got any more questions, if you could pop them in the, in the chat now, please, and then I'm going to close it. Um, are there any educational standards that Bacon's aspires to beyond the national curriculum? For example, taking from educational methods or standards abroad. Um, is that worth just talking a little bit about how we how the United Learning Curriculum is it comes together? Uh, yes, yeah, so the United Learning Curriculum is, you know, it's designed by professionals uh, that are responsible for the curriculum across 80 odd schools. So it's a really good quality, comprehensive, broad curriculum. Um, lots of United Learning schools, you know, we, we get Ofsteded um, most most schools every three years. And so the, the UL curriculum has been through many, many Ofsted inspections and got a real clean bill of health. Uh, and it's really grounded in lots of research as well about what an effective uh, curriculum is. And if you look at the curriculum document, which is on our website and on the UL website, um, it, it really goes into great detail about what the thinking behind that curriculum is what the intent of that curriculum is, how we implement uh, that curriculum and what the impact of it as well. So um, it's, I, I, you know, that, that could be a whole um, whole meeting in itself, to be honest. Um, but I, I'm really pleased with the United Learning Curriculum and then we adapt it to our own context as well. So we don't just take it off the shelf and, 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 and run with it. You know, we take the UL curriculum as a framework, then each individual subject will adapt it to the to the context of, of this school and it, 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 uh, it does work very well. Thank you. OK, there's been a question about school hours and if I could just direct um, all parents and carers to the website, the timetable for every year group is on the website. If you click on the link that says school life, um, the timetable is on there for every year group. So uh, we, we, we won't go through all of that now. Um, and then a question here about how we support high achieving students in the school. I suppose it's what we used to call the gifted and talented. Yeah, so we, we don't have a gifted and talented program per se, because the way we group students together, um, students, you know, it's either in setting or streaming um, and a student is placed in an appropriate group according to their current levels of attainment. So if students are really achieving at high levels, then they'll be in sets that are going to stretch and challenge them. Um, and the, the, the some of the trouble of when you have things like gifted and talented groups or, you know, you might call them grammar groups or grammar pathways and things like that. You know, sometimes that's the focus is on what you do outside of the classroom, whereas the, the biggest difference and the biggest. The, the thing that makes the most difference and all the research shows is that what happens in the classroom is absolutely crucial. So you can run extension enrichment activities after school and at weekends and so on. But if if what is happening in the classroom isn't really stretching and challenge those students, then that is not an effective use of time. So we spend the bulk of our effort here and the bulk of our training, making sure that all students are stretched and challenged according to their uh, ability. So I mean, I've, I've got a year 11 physics group, for example. Um, we've got lots of high ability uh, students in there and, and you know, we're going to get a, a really good crop of grade nines um, coming out of that class uh, this year. Uh, lots of them are going to go on to study uh, physics at A-level and once students are in A-level, um, if they're likely to get, you know, the really high grades of A's and A-stars, we'll start doing Oxbridge uh, preparation for them, Oxbridge visits, Oxbridge coaching to help them with their applications to get them to those um, those top universities and those Russell Group universities. So um, although we might not have programmes labelled gifted and talented per se, uh, we're very mindful that we need to stretch all students, particularly our most able, who, who are capable of getting those top grades and getting to the top universities. Lovely, thank you. And the last question, and it's nice to know that somebody is thinking about the staff, but how do we support staff with their own well-being? Because quite rightly, this parent says happier staff equals happier college. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, it's really appreciated. Um, we we are really conscious of staff well-being, um, so we we can workload is something that we take care of uh, quite well. So, uh, and yeah, you know, I could give another another really wide-ranging answer to this. But for example, we've moved away from marking every single piece of work in every single student's book. 
uh, because that is an incredibly onerous task. It places a huge amount of pressure on teachers and gets in the way of them planning really good lessons. So we'll do things like whole class feedback or marking on a page, which gives you know, really good quality feedback to the students, but it doesn't mean a teacher has to sit there and mark a whole set of books and take it from me. You know, when you used to take a set of books home to mark, you could be looking at three hours to mark one set of books. And if you've got seven or eight classes, trying to do that every week is it's just unmanageable in most cases. So we can we can do things like that. A lot of homework is now done online. And so once again, instead of teachers having to plan, set and mark homework, a lot of that is done online. That's not just to reduce the work that teachers are doing, but it also but it means they're free to do more of the stuff around the planning uh, and the intervention for students um, to give a better quality provision uh, in, in the classroom. In terms of other broader well-being, we have you know, various support packages. So um, th there's a counselling service available uh, for staff as well. Uh, we use our inset days to make sure uh, staff um, feel supported in, in their work life. We do a regular survey of staff where we ask them about work life balance and what we can do uh, to improve that. So we're mindful of it. We can't take it. You know, we can't do everything, you know, and teaching is a challenging job. And that's the reason we go into it. And you know, when you've got a thousand young people in the building and you're teaching classes of 30, you know, it, it, it's not always um, relaxing, put it that way. Uh, but nevertheless, we're mindful of that and we want to help staff with their well-being. And you're absolutely right. Happier staff, you're happier children, happier college and staff turnover here is a lot lower uh, than the national and the London average, uh, which is an indication that staff do like working here. They are happy here um, and, and they want to stay here. Lovely, that's okay. it. That's uh, I'm just going to have a quick look through the questions while you're there as well, just in case I've missed anything. Um, college hours, yeah, they're on the website, Monday to Friday. We just finished at 2.30 on a Friday, so it's not a half day per se. Someone's asked about child developing anxiety. Um, please email your uh, child's head of year and, and then we'll look into what's happened and what we can do to help. So rather than addressing that here, uh, do that in um, uh, through the head of year. And I th think that is it. OK, Jane? Yeah. Lovely. I will share a recording. Oh, perfect timing. I've just had a message saying there's five minutes left on the actual meeting time. Um, thank you to everybody who has joined us this evening. I will upload a recording of tonight's session onto the website um, and share it with uh, with everybody in the parent community. And we'll come back to you about the sports day. OK, so thanks very much for joining everyone. Hope you found that useful. And I really like these questions. You know, there's never Never, never too many questions and if we can answer anything you've got uh, do, do do come back to us okay we'd really be pleased to help thanks very much good night thanks very much then take care everyone bye bye